be dealing with a brief approach to uh, muscle disease at the bedside categorization and some uh, examples. So, uh, as you know that, um, as you know, muscles are excitable tissues and they are capable of contracting to respond. So, if any, if any stimuli is there, they contract. That's an elastic material and muscles form about 40% of body weight. And there are about 600 muscles in the human body. And your nerve cell and the muscle it supplies forms the motor unit. Your motor unit means a nerve cell in the ventral horn of the spinal cord and the number of muscles that it supplies together is called motor unit. And this motor unit is a functional unit and it varies in number from about 100 in intrinsic muscles of the hand to thousands in big muscles like muscles of the legs. So number of motor units are variable depending on the size of the muscle. And the muscle fibers in a motor unit, as you know, one anterior horn cell and the muscles that it supplies forms the motor unit. And the number of muscle fibers in a motor unit is also variable. Like the number of motor units in a muscle is variable. Number of muscle fibers in a uh, motor unit is also variable for fine uh, functions. There are several uh, motor units and for coarse functions, the motor units are less. And the muscles are grossly <laughs> classified. <laughs> into... Am I audible? Yes, madam, you are clearly audible. Please uh, proceed. Uh, the muscles are classified into skeletal muscle, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. So we have got about 600 muscles. They have their connection with the ventral horn that forms the motor unit. The motor unit numbers depend on the size of the muscle. And the motor unit number of muscle fibers supplied by a motor unit is more in fine muscles for intrinsic activities and it is less in big muscles which carry coarse activities. And they are classified into skeletal muscles, smooth muscles and cardiac muscles. So skeletal muscles are one which are uh, attached to the skeletal structures. And uh, other muscles are not attached to the skeletal. Smooth muscle and cardiac muscles are not attached to any skeleton. And depending on the uh, type of function the muscles do, they are classified as involuntary muscles and voluntary muscles. So depending on the attachment, they are either skeletal muscle, smooth muscle or cardiac muscle, which is a combination of both skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. And depending on the type of control, they are classified into voluntary muscles and involuntary muscles. And based on the histological appearance, they are classified into striated muscle and non-striated muscle. So based on various uh, aspects, they are categorized differently. And as you know, uh, the, um, we have got skeletal muscle, we have got skeletal muscle, the ca cardiac muscle and the smooth muscle. So what is a skeletal muscle? Skeletal muscle is a voluntary muscle and it is attached to the skeletal system. And these muscle fibers show alternate dark and light bands and these are called striations. So skeletal muscles are striated muscles and they are supplied by somatic nerves. So uh, skeletal, uh, skeletal muscles have striations and they receive their supply from the somatic and uh, motor nerves. And skeletal muscle fibers contains myofibrils. And it lies in the, the, these muscle fibers lie in the sarcoplasm. The myofibrils lie in the sarcoplasm and enclosed by the sarcolemma. The muscle fiber contains just a brief uh, uh, revision of anatomy and physiology. The muscle fiber contains dark, refringent, anisotropic part called A band. So A band is anisotropic. And isotropic band is called I band. So they have got dark, refringent, anisotropic part called A band. In the center of the A band, there is a slightly light area called Henson's node or H band. And the light isotropic area is the I band. So A band is anisotropic. And in the center of the A band, a lighter area called H band is there. And a light isotropic area called the I band. And a, a dark area in the center of the I band is the Z zone. So isotropic is I band. 
anisotropic is a band and in the center of the a band we have got the h zone and in the center of the i band we have got the z zone so this is a muscle and it is having so many fibers and it is covered by fascia and it is having blood supply and then um, these muscles have uh, subunits the myofibrils and the myofibril contain the contractile element actin and myosin the involuntary muscles the next is the smooth muscles smooth muscles are the muscles we see in the intestines and all they are involuntary muscles and do not have striations they are supplied by autonomic nerves because these you know, muscles are autonomous. So unlike the striated muscles or the skeletal muscles, you know, they are not autonomous, they are voluntary, so they are supplied by the somatic nerves. Whereas the involuntary smooth muscles which are autonomous are supplied by autonomic nerves. And smooth muscles are present in the wall of the hollow internal organs. And they are also called visceral muscles. So skeletal muscles are attached to skeleton, so they are called skeletal muscle. And the smooth muscles are attached to hollow on internal organs, so they are called visceral muscles. So this is a smooth muscle, and smooth muscle uh, uh, consists of uh, thick filaments and thin filaments, and uh, they have got intermediate filaments, the dense bodies and the nucleus. Then the cardiac muscle, a striated muscle, uh, but involuntary. So it is a mixed. Uh, yeah, it's a striated muscle. Cardiac muscle has striation like the skeletal muscle, but it is involuntary muscle. Whereas the skeletal muscle is striated and voluntary, cardiac muscle is striated but involuntary. And they are regulated by the input from the autonomic nervous system. So it's a combination of skeletal muscle and the smooth muscle. And these form muscles of the heart. So that is cardiac muscle. These are the three basic types of muscles. Uh, and then we have got a Syncytial junctions and branching. So we have got the cardiac muscle which is having a uh, very co complex function. It is having several branching. Unlike the smooth muscle or the skeletal muscle, they are having syncytial junctions and branching. So they resemble the skeletal muscle in that they have striations. They resemble the smooth muscle in that they are involuntary and they receive the autonomic uh, nervous system supply and they are having branches and syncytial junctions. So now we saw that you have got a A band, anisotropic, uh, and a, a central H zone, and an I band isotropic and its central Z zone. So the distance between two Z zones, two I, I bands, uh, uh, I, center of two I bands will be two Z, Z zones. This so two Z zones forms the functional unit of the muscle. So uh, region covered between two Z zones, that is two isotropic band. The isotropic band has got a central area called Z zone and the region between two Z zones forms the functional unit of the muscle. Iso anisotropic is formed by myosin. Anisotropic, we saw that it has got a central H band and it is formed by myosin and the isotropic band is formed by troponin, tropomyosin and actin. So the striated muscles has a zone and I zone. All of us know that I am repeating for clarity. And the A zone has got a central H zone. And the A zone contains myosin. The I zone contains troponin, tropomyosin and actin. And the Z line bisects the I band. So two Z zones form the functional unit of the muscle or the sarcomere. And the Z zone bisects the I band. And the center of the A band where the thin filaments do not overlap the thick filament is the H zone. We have seen that. And the center of the H zone has a globular prominence and forms the M line. So just remember striated muscle has got an anisotropic and an isotropic. In the isotropic, there is this alternate. In the isotropic, there is a central Z zone. In the region between two Z zones from the sarcomere or the functional unit of the muscle. And the anisotropic contains myosin. The isotropic contains troponin, tropomyosin, and actin. So this is the sarcomere. That is the region between two Z zones. Here you can see one Z zone and another Z zone. In between is the sarcomere. And it is having a H zone in the middle. 
So this is again uh, another view of the sarcomere is between two ESR zones and we saw actin is in the anisotropic, isotropic band. Myosin is in the uh, anisotropic band and this is a ESR line and same line. And we have got actin and we have got uh, actin, uh, we have got myosin. Myosin is seen in the anisotropic part and actin is in the isotropic part. So we have got anisotropic uh, region whose center has got a H zone and inside that there is an M zone. And the isotropic band which has got a central Z zone. The region between two Z zones is the sarcomere. And contracted muscle actin of I band. Actin of I band. So the actin, this contains actin, uh, uh, troponin and tropomycin. And this one contains myosin. So contracted muscle actin of I band and M region of A band come closer. So during contraction, the actin of the I band and the myosin of the A band, they come closer. And the relaxed zone state these muscles are isolated. So the muscle proteins are myosin, actin, troponin and tropomycin. And it is come, uh, we, uh, myosin is come, uh, containing six polypeptide chains, two heavy and two four light chains. The two heavy chains wrap around each other and form a double helix. One end of each chain is folded into a globular head and the other is the tail. The light chains are present near the myosin head. The tails of the myosin molecule join together to form the body of the myosin filament. The heads of the myosin protrude beyond the body and that portion connecting the head and the body forms the arm. Head and the arm together forms the cross bridges. So this is the myosin. You can see the light chain. We can see the heavy chain. And this is the head region. Then we see what is this? Uh, actin, troponin and tropomycin. So this is present in the isotropic part of the skeletal muscle. So actin filaments contain double helix made of actin molecule, four actin molecule, molecules. The uh, actin molecules contain polymerized G actin molecules and ADP that is adenosine deaminase molecules are present in the actin filaments for energy. And actin has got active binding sites. These are the sites where the cross bridges of the myosin interact to cause muscle contraction. In the active binding sites of actin, Myosin comes and binds and produces muscle contraction. And it is a double helix structure. And this lies on the groove between the two strands of the F actin. And in the resting state, state tropomycin covers the actin. We saw that in the I band, we have got actin, tropomycin, and tropon. Uh, we have got actin and tropomycin. And in the resting state, tropomycin covers the active binding sites of the actin so that it cannot contract. And troponin is a globular protein with three subunits, that is troponin I, troponin T, and troponin C. Troponin I has affinity for actin, troponin T has affinity for tropomycin, and troponin C has affinity for calcium. So this is the picture of the thin filament showing troponin, tropomycin, and actin. So this is the troponin tropomycin complex uh, is called the relaxing protein. Troponin tropomycin complex is called the relaxing protein. So this is for muscle relaxation. Some specific disorders, this is dysfunctional. And this normally inhibits actomycin uh, actin coming together. So troponin reversibly combines with calcium. When calcium is bound by troponin, inhibition is uh, prevented resulting in contraction. Troponin and calcium exposes binding sites of actin and promotes contraction. After an action potential, calcium is taken up by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The T complex comes closer and facilitates relaxation by a series of reactions. So, tropomycin, so in this part, you remember between two Z bands is the sarcomere. And A band contains myosin, the other one contains uh, tropomycin, troponin, and uh, troponin and tropomycin complex inhibits myosin ATPS and relax the muscle. 
So troponin tropomycin complex inhibits myosin ATPase and relax the muscle. Then we have got the internal conducting system, which is called as the sarcotubular system. Uh, so that uh, uh, I will just show the sarcotubular system, which is the energy transporting system inside the muscle. So when a nerve impulse reaches the neuromuscular junction, it activates the motor end plate and action potential is formed at the motor end plate. And property of the muscle is excitability, contractivity and elasticity and conduction to neighboring muscles. So that is the property of the muscle. So this is a, uh, when a nerve impulse reaches, we get the simple muscle teach. All of us have done it in our uh, uh, basic uh, science sessions. So the link between excitation and contraction happens by a highly specialized internal conducting system. Sequestration of calcium by the sarcoplasmic reticulum causes the relaxed state. When calcium increases by the arrival of the nerve impulse, ATP is hydrolyzed by myosin ATPs to yield energy for contraction. So mechanism of muscle contraction, this action potential, when the nerve impulse comes, uh, action potential is formed and this action potential uh, travels along the sarcolemma and the T-tubules. And the action potential on reaching the terminal vesicle of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Releases calcium and ions from it. So calcium ion bind to calcium binding sites on troponin molecule. And this bondage of calcium with troponin weakens the link of and troponin tropomycin uh, complex is thus the relaxing protein. So sliding membrane hypothesis, the change cause this change causes the troposin to move away and exo exposes the active binding sites on actin molecule. And when it is exposed, the active binding sites attract the head of the myosin and come together rela rela resulting in contraction. And at the end of the contraction, uh, uh, the uh, ATPS activity in the head of the myosin cleaves ATP to ADP and releases energy. <laughs> Energy produced during this reaction helps in the sliding of, of actin filament over the myosin filament. And this is the, uh, this is called the uh, sliding membrane hypothesis. And there is a tilt of the head of the myosin, then releases the ADP and phosphate molecules from it. New ATP molecules formed then binds to the head of the myosin, causing detachment of the myosin from the active site on Actin molecule. Cleavage of ATP molecule begins next cycle leading to a new power stroke. So now we will see what is isometric contraction and what is the So we have got a Various types of contraction, isometric contraction and isotonic contraction. What is isometric? The length is constant. What is isotonic? The tone is constant. Muscle has contractile and elastic property as we have already seen. And isometric contraction, the length does not change. Oh. 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 Isometric contraction, the length does not change. Length is decided by the resting length of the muscle <coughs> and, and it is for position maintenance. Whereas the isotonic is a tone does not change but length changes. It is for uh, external work like walking etc. So in isotonic the tone remains same but the length changes. Whereas in isometric the length remains same and the tone changes. Davidia, during relaxation, calcium ions are going to tell you the water will be fresh for them. Make a basket of the 
ஸோ அதுக்கு வந்து அடிச்சுட்டு இந்த ஏசி ஒர்க் பண்ண மாட்டேங்குது During relaxation, calcium ions are separated from troponin molecule and pumped back into the terminal system. So, calcium ions are separated from the troponin molecule and pumped back into the terminal system and then changes that occur during contraction are reversed so that relaxation takes place. What is that? Then the PPT move on. So when our patients, so now we saw grossly the anatomy physiology and we have got 600 muscles and 40% of the body weight is formed by muscles. When there is a disease, they form Pierre motor uh, element syndrome. So when the muscle is diseased, they form Pierre motor element syndrome. So when a patient comes with the Pierre motor element syndrome, what are all the questions to be asked? We have to ask, is it a muscle disease or anterior consul disease? And if, if muscle disease, is it inherited or acquired? Then what is the pattern in which the muscle is involved? And what are the clues for acute disorders? And how are you going to confirm the disease? So always draw a pedigree chart. All of us know the gender, uh, then uh, whether you know the gender or not, abortions, Identical twins, uh, non-identical twins, homozygous inherited disorders, heterozygous inherited disorders. How are you going to mark? So this, these are basic symbols. There are much more uh, symbols. Uh, these basic symbols should be remembered and uh, always draw a pedigree chart. So first, uh, when a patient comes with a PR motor syndrome, unable to walk. So we want to know whether it is a psychogenic paralysis. So variable power, at one point when you check, the power is 5. Another point, it is 3. So variable power. Of course, you have to remember conditions of neuromuscular junction where the power can vary. But non-organic, it varies from person. Uh, every time you check because patient cannot imitate the same kind of power all the time. And sudden giveaway. He will resist, then suddenly give away. Unpatterned. So we have very many diseases have got a pattern. And that pattern is not there. And when you examine, there are no signs. And there is slow getting up and sitting easier than fast. We will tell them, okay, sir, you are having paralysis. So don't get up fast. Get up slowly and sit slowly. So getting up and sitting slowly is a finer movement than a coarse movement of sitting quickly and getting up. So a person with an organic disease will find it Easier to quickly sit and quickly get up using trick movements. Whereas slow sitting and slow getting up is difficult. It becomes reverse in non-organic conditions. So these are grossly the clues when somebody presents with a non-organic motor system problem. Then we want to so see whether it is an anterior consul disease. So there is another pattern that is called selection within a zone. In, in some uh, case discussions we have seen, each zone has got a group of muscles. For example, if you take C5, C5 supplies supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, biceps, deltoid. So if it is a root involvement, all these muscles will have some degree of involvement. Whereas in anterior consul, it is a motor unit. We saw what is a motor unit. Motor unit is not the number of fibers in a root. They are the one anterior consul its axon and the number of muscle it supplies forms the motor unit. So in anterior consul disease, it is the motor unit that becomes sick. So all the muscles that come out through your root will not be affected. One muscle will be normal, one muscle will be partially affected, one muscle will be not at all affected because what gets degenerated is a motor unit. So it is called selection within a zone. If it is a C5 root, all the muscles, I said, will be affected to some extent. But if it is an anterior consul of C5, the biceps may be severely affected. The rest of the muscles coming from that will be normal. Or within the biceps, a segment may be affected. The rest will be normal. That is called selection within a zone. 
and motor root as I said as the classical radicular pattern. And plexus, what is plexus pattern? More than one nerve coming from the plexus. For example, if you say whether my patient is having a femoral neuropathy or an L3 radiculopathy or a lumbosacral plexopathy. When you examine, if you find that the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve are involved, then it is a plexopathy. So more than one nerve coming from a plexus, if they are involved, it is likely to be a plexopathy. And motor nerves have got a nerve pattern, like if you have radial nerve or post interosseous nerve or uh, anterior interosseous nerve. So they will have a nerve pattern. The muscles that is supplied by that nerve alone will be affected. And neuromuscular junction, they have got a, a typical pattern of oculobulbar involvement, fluctuations, asymmetry and variability. And uh, so that is uh, the various patterns in muscle disease. So what are all the definitions? What is myopathy? Myopathy is any progressive muscle disease. So you do not know whether it is an uh, acute disease or an inherited disease, we do not know. Any progressive muscle disease is called myopathy. And muscular dystrophy is the term applied when you find that the disease is genetically determined. When you are sure it is genetically determined, you use the term muscular dystrophy. So muscle diseases are a wide spectrum. There are red herrings. Cross-territorial and dual pathology can confuse the situation. So we'll uh, see some of the basic templates and some common uh, situations so that we are able to answer the five questions we started, whether it is psychogenic or whether it is muscle, whether it is anterior horn cell, whether it is myoneural junction or is it motor roots or plexus or combinations. So we have to do the power examination that is done by the MRC grading. All of us know that. I will not elaborate. Next, you have to check the tone. Tone is resistance offered to passive movement. And then you see the where nutrition, whether wasting is there or not. Then you check the coordination and look for abnormal movements like fasciculation, fibrillation, cramps, myokymia, contractures. And then observe the patient in action and in rest. So patient should be examined when he's resting. Then he's made to walk. He's to, made to get up from the sitting posture, stand on one leg, walk on heel, walk on toes, like that. And certain disease markers, always look for certain disease markers. So when you are observing the patient, look for markers of some diseases. Does he have facial paresis, which he is not aware, he may not tell. He will say always my son has got this kind of expressionless face. We didn't bother about it, it is there in his father also. The diagnosis is over, it is FSHD. So facial paresis, they will think it is like father. Baldness. So baldness also will be ignored and bringing up the scapula, ptosis. So when you are examining the patient in rest, look for these cardinal features which they may not complain. They may think it is there in the other family members and it is normal for their family. Then different patterns of involvement and sparing of certain muscle groups. So when you are examining the patient in rest, you are inspecting, then you are examining and grouping which muscle is involved, which muscle is not involved. Then weakness, degree, distribution, symmetry, fatigability. So how weak it is? What is the distribution? Is there selectivity? Are they symmetrical? Are they fatigable? Is there atrophy? Is there hypertrophy? Is there any uh, hypotonia, myotonia, uh, and movements, fibrillation, fasciculations, tremors, myotonia, myokymia, cramps, contractures, and pseudo contractures. Then we are going to grade the power 0 to 5. All of us know 0 is no movement and 5 is uh, normal movement. <laughs> then, when testing movement, family support the part proximal to it so that only the desired movement is tested. And leverage is applied, should match between patient and examiner. So, you have to eliminate gravity. That is by changing position. We have got break test. Resistance is applied to a limb after it has completed its range of motion. That is isometric. And length principle, power is the best at the shortest position of the muscle. And uh, so you have to check the power in the short position of the muscle. And isotonic, active resistance, 
and test applied during active movement. Isometric limb is fixed and breaking based on the movement of the muscle being tested. Like for example, when you are checking triceps. So these are the uh, various uh, positions where the muscle length, uh, lengthens. That means uh, tone is constant. That is isotonic length changes. Isometric is length is constant, tone changes. And rotation is a combination of both. That so tone is a resistance offered to passive movement and is the state of partial contraction always present in the normal muscle for maintenance of posture with minimal expenditure of energy. And we have got various reflexes, uh, superficial reflexes or motor responses to scraping of the skin or mucous membrane. Deep reflexes, whenever a muscle within an intact nerve supply is stretched, it contracts. And organic reflexes are bowel bladder. So you have got hollow visceral myopathies where bowel bladder can be involved. And uh, primitive reflexes or release reflexes. Then grading of deep tendon reflexes is 0 to 4, uh, absent to clonus. So now we will come to the muscle disease proper. And we have got some signs. So as I said, the, you uh, inspect, we don't know the patient is having muscle disease. We are testing by inspection, looking for cardinal clues, and we are testing them in action, grading the power tone reflexes. And after that, we'll go, we think that our patient has got a muscle disease and there are some signs. Hip up sign, tripod sign and gower sign is very familiar for all of us. Hip up sign is when the hip extensor is weak, patient will use the paraspinal muscles. Uh, uh, erector spinae has got an origin from the iliac crust. So he will try to pull the uh, hip with the help of the uh, upper uh, paraspinal muscle or the erector spinae. So what happens? The erector spinae cannot pull the hip uh, if it is erecting the spine. So the spine will come down, patient will bend and he will lift up the hip. That is called hip up sign. <laughs> that means our patient's Gluteus maximus is affected and erector spinae is trying to help in lifting the hip. And uh, then next is the tripod sign. After lifting the hip, patient wants to stand. So what he will do? We can stand by uh, stabilizing the cruciate ligaments. So patient will put one hand on the knee and put one hand on the floor. So two legs and one hand. That is called a tripod sign. After that, once he has stabilized one knee, he will try to slowly lift the opposite hand and stabilize the opposite knee and slowly erect and then stand on the ligaments and bones. This is called gower sign. When we have got abductor muscle weakness, there is hip dip. Instead of the Tendelenburg effect, when you put one leg for, uh, down, the opposite hip should go up. Here it will dip. And that results in the badly. That means the gluteus medius and minimus are weak. Then poppy sign is sudden tapering of the upper arm due to wasted biceps and retained deltoid. So this poppy sign, if you see, or the decreased facial expression, which the father also has, son also has, then the diagnosis is over. And you have got valley sign and polyhill sign that I will be uh, showing. Then we have a valley sign is seen in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, poly yield sign in facioscapular human dystrophy, calf head on trophy sign uh, is seen in Miyoshi myopathy. I will be showing those classical cases. And uh, that is a calf head on trophy sign is due to prominent deltoid, wasted triceps, infraspinatus, upper border of the trapezius forming the horn, and prominent infraspinatus forms the downward directed ears and spine of the scapula forms the neck of the uh, cough and levator scapula and rhomboids form the subnuchal hump. This is called cough head on trophy sign described by uh, Professor Pradhan. Then you have got the shank sign in myotonic dystrophy. Uh, here, uh, when the patient keeps the shoulder slightly abducted and flexed arm, you see the wasted biceps, triceps, uh, and forearm muscles produce a shank of the animal, uh, shank of the animal look. So you have got the proximal muscles. When you keep the arm abducted and flexed at the elbow, the proximal muscles are thinned out. The forearm muscles are relatively better. And this sign is called as the shank sign, which is seen in myotonic dystrophy.
Then you have got diamond on quadrature. So I'll be showing these things, then it will become easy. That is seen in Miyoshi Mayapadi, LGMD 2B and LGMD 2B. And aldermonia posturing is exaggerated lumbar lordosis, arms thrown backwards, shoulders and belly in front. This is seen in central core disease in children. So these are all things which we observe and then uh, get a diagnostic clue. And Tapir's mouth is whistling mouth appearance. Now that is seen in facial palsy, bilateral facial or orbicularis uh, ovaries muscle involved. They have a Tapir's mouth. And cadaveric facies is a thin, round out, atrophic uh, facial muscles with no expression. That is myotonic dystrophy. And valley sign is seen in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That is because of the prominent deltoid and medial scapular border and wasted latissimus dorsi. So, uh, prominent deltoid and the wasted latissimus dorsi uh, for, forms the valley and the hill. So, the wasted latissimus dorsi forms the valley and the prominent deltoid and the medial scapular form, border forms the uh, hill. Then uh, polyhill sign is facioscapular humeral dystrophy. Here we see a large infraspinatus, biceps, and brachioradialis. This is an unusual thing. Most of the muscular uh, dystrophic conditions, brachioradialis will be wasted. So in FSHD, brachioradialis is preserved with winged scapula, the scapular hum, and prominent acromioclavicular joint. All these forms the uh, several hills, the six hills. That is a large infraspinatus, biceps, prominent brachioradialis, winged scapula, the scapular hump, and the prominent acromioclavicular joint. So this is the hip up sign. You can normally we can never imitate this because we normally get up from the sitting posture by keeping our pelvis down. And we get up N block with the trunk up. So when the hip extensor is weak, the patient puts switches off the erector spine from erecting the spine and pulls the hip up. <clears throat> and this is the aldermoniac uh, posture we see in central core disease. You can see that the exaggerated lumbar lordosis, the hand going backwards, and the, there is a back knee. And this is a, a drooping. We will see the differential diagnosis, bilateral drooping seen in mitochondrial disorders, progressive external ocular my, uh, ophthalmoplegia syndrome, ocular myopathies, oculopharyngeal myopathies, myo, myasthenia. So these are the various. So when we inspect, is the eye muscles involved? Are they symmetrically involved? What is the posture? So, and this is the valley sign. You can see the uh, latissimus dorsi and the prominent deltoid and the medial scapular border. So this is the uh, valley sign. This is a hypertrophic cough. We know that there are several differential diagnoses for hypertrophic cough. You can get both in inherited muscle disease and acute muscle disease. Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Becker's muscular dystrophy, myotonic dystrophy, then you have got various kinds of subtypes of dystrophic muscle diseases. Then you get it in uh, hypothyroidism, parasitic myositis. So what you see is a uh, prominent cough. When you see in uh, hypothyroid, it's called Hoffman syndrome. This is what is the trophy in cough head. I said uh, all the features of this. This is seen in, uh, this is the typical uh, trophy in cough head described by uh, Professor Pradhan, for which uh, he, he, I think he was he received the Padma Bhushan. Padma Shri, Padma Shri, I think. So this is the diamond on quadriceps. Diamond on quadriceps. This is seen in Miyoshi Mayapati. So if you see this, by making the patient slightly bend his knee, and you see this, uh, near histological diagnosis is made. And this is cough wasting. Uh, cough wasting you find in anterior one cell disease and uh, we, uh, lower motor neuron syndromes can be many types. We say hypertrophic cough, pseudo hypertrophic cough uh, is usually typical of uh, some conditions. We say, and you have got Noneka and Miyoshi, 
posterior calf wasting you see in Miyoshi myopathy and anterior consult syndromes like wasted leg syndromes. And this is the cadaveric phases of myotonic dystrophy. You can see the neck muscles uh, which are thinned out and uh, masseters are wasted and uh, expressionless uh, prominent eyes. This is the cadaveric phases you see in myotonic dystrophy. And this is again another example of a polyhill sign uh, in FSHD. We can see that uh, this brachioradialis is preserved. Most of the dystrophic muscle disease brachioradialis will be wasted or lost. This is an exception you see them. That forms the polyhill sign. This is also another example. So after having inspected, made him sit, get up, walk, uh, yeah, and uh, put down all the muscles, check the power, reflex a stone, then categorize them. Then categorize them into patterns. So what is the pattern? Proximal girdle pattern. So it's a limb girdle. Proximal limb girdle pattern. That is one pattern. That is the commonest pattern in most of the muscle diseases. And we have got a distal pattern. We have got a distal myopathy. That is a distal pattern. So after having inspected, examined, noted all the various signs, categorize them into uh, these various categories. This is called pattern recognition. And recognize the pattern at the end of the inspection and examination. So proximal girdle pattern or distal pattern, then upper limb distal and lower limb proximal. Typically you find it in inclusion body myositis. So when you find that the upper limb, the distal muscles are weak, the lower limb proximal muscles are weak. Why is this happening? Then immediately get the clue. This is seen in inclusion body myositis. So that is pattern recognition. And lower limbs distal and upper limb proximal. You see it in facial scapula, humeral dystrophy, distal myopathy with rimmed, rimmed vacuole, these conditions. Then whether there is a cranial nerve involvement. So mitochondrial disorders, myosthen, neuromuscular junction uh, disorders, oculopharyngeal myopathies, and uh, central core disease, all these, there is a cranial muscle involvement, FSHD. Then is there a family history? Is there involvement of other systems? A hypertrophic cough with hypothyroidism. You know that it is a Kaufman, Hoffman syndrome. So uh, like that. So uh, at the end of uh, inspection, uh, sit, uh, examination, doing all the various uh, elicitation of reflex, you recognize the pattern in the proximal girdle pattern, distal pattern, upper limb distal, lower limb proximal, lower limb distal, upper limb proximal, with or without involvement of the cranial nerve, with or without family history, and what about other systems? These questions will be answered at the end of gross history and examination. So now let us see what is hypertrophy versus pseudo hypertrophy. So large muscles with normal power is true hypertrophy. So true hypertrophy is the bodybuilders. They do a lot of exercise. Their muscles are very strong and they are big. That is true hypertrophy. Whereas what is pseudo hypertrophy? Pseudo hypertrophy is a big muscle which is weak. A big weak muscle is pseudo hypertrophy. <coughs> so these muscles feel rubbery. They don't feel stony hard like the um, Herculean muscles built by bodybuilders. Whereas these muscles look rubbery because of the connective tissue. So the this is seen in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Becker's LGMD. Hoffman syndrome and Deber semilane. Hoffman is hypothyroidism in the adult. Deber semilane is creatine where the paraspinal muscles hypertrophy. So in uh, children with hypothyroidism, uh, Cocker Deber semilane. It is called Cocker Deber semilane, the paraspinal muscles hypertrophy. Then you get pseudo hypertrophy in amyloid disease, Fucutin myopathies, parasitic myopathy, carnitin deficiency myopathy, or cholesterol myopathy, that is Ullmann's disease. Then this is a typically pseudo hypertrophic muscle uh, in a patient with ficutin where there can be asymmetry. You can see the other leg which is not showing that pseudo hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a stiff paraspinal muscle. Stiff man syndrome, uh, always uh, not very typical patient will, in the early phase, they will have some twitchings here and there and they will say they are stiff. And when you do the routine examinations, we may miss it. And always look at the paraspinal muscles. You can see the 
standing out paraspinal muscles. So if you may, uh, the my diagnosis usually gets delayed because of uh, not looking at the paraspinal muscles and waiting for the gross signs to appear. So this is the stiff paraspinal muscle in a uh, stiff person syndrome. This is macroglossia. You find in amyloidosis, parasitic myopathies, uh, myositis, hypothyroidism. Uh, so that is uh, macroglossia. So always look for treatable causes. So what are all the situations where you look for treatable causes? No family history. We have done the family tree. Even though the patient is progressively sick and is worsening, family history is not there. It may be a chronic polymyositis. They look like inherited muscle diseases, but family history is not there. So absence of family history, become alerted and look for a treatable cause. Demonstrable fatigability. That is at the time of examination, uh, at rest it is grade 4 and after walking it becomes grade 3. All patients will say fatigue. But are you able to demonstrate a drop in the power? The demonstrable fatigability points to a treatable disease. And presence of pain, it is indicating that it is the perifascicular structures that it, because the muscle fiber as such is not pain sensitive. It is epimysium, perimysium, endomuscular nerves and vessels, they are pain sensitive. So if the pain is there, it may be dermatomyositis, polymyositis, endocrine myopathies, where the connective tissue of the muscle also is getting involved, not just the cytoskeleton. So absence of family history, demonstrable fatigability, presence of pain, absence of selectivity. We saw the polyheel sign, valley sign, diamond on, quadriceps sign, all these signs indicate selectivity of muscles involvement. So absence of selectivity, all the muscles are uniformly involved. That will point to uh, probably an acute condition. No selectivity, it may not be dystrophy. And retained reflexes. Most of the muscle diseases, angle jerk is retained, but other reflexes are suppressed. If all the reflexes are retained, you will think of thyrotoxic myopathy, calcium metabolism, magnesium metabolism. Uh, so all these renal tubular acidosis, um, those conditions presenting muscle, they have retained reflex, parathyroid adenomas, and presence of other system changes also indicates a reversible muscle disease. So absence of family history, demonstrable fatigability, presence of pain, absence of selectivity, retained reflexes, and other system changes uh, um, should motivate us more to look for a reversible cause. So pain, so when it uh, when the patient has got a, a pain, you see whether the pain is coming from the muscle or non-muscular structures. The muscle as such uh, is not pain sensitive, it is always from the non-muscular structures, but uh, it comes from the epimysium, perimysium, endomysium or joints, nerves, tendons. Like that you look for which part is producing the pain. And we find rest pain in mitochondrial disease, mixer connective tissue disease, lipid storage disease. So the rest, pain and rest. Exertion induced pain is seen in pseudoclodic patient, glycogen storage disease and mitochondrial diseases. Exertion induced pain will be seen. And muscle fiber as such is not pain sensitive. Then what is myogenic uh, pain, which is seen in acquired muscle diseases, that is inflammatory metabolic endocrine and mitochondrial diseases because of the lactic acid accumulation. And rest pain and cramps are seen in lipid storage disease. And exertion pain and cramps are seen in glycogen storage disease, mitochondrial disease, dermatomyositis. So these, uh, <clears throat> these pains are called pseudoclaudication because it comes on exertion, but you are not able to demonstrate any evidence for vascular claudication or neurogenic claudication. So these things of pain and cramps which comes on exertion in the absence of features of vascular claudication or neurogenic claudication is called pseudoclaudication. Then contractures. Uh, what is a cramp? What is a contracture? What is a pseudocontracture? So cramp is a painful shortening due to energy deprived state of the muscle. So unaccustomed exertion in normal person and accustomed exertion in abnormal person. And EMG is active. So that is a cramp. So cramps can be normal uh, when you do unaccustomed exertion and there is energy deprived state. Whereas energy deprived state in normal exertion indicate a metabolic problem. 
so that is a cramp and emg will be active if you do emg into the uh, cramping muscle the emg will be active so contracture is mildly painful shortening always pathological and emg is silent this is seen in myofasciforelic deficiency such my metabolic disorders where there is mildly painful shortening of the muscle and you put the emg needle it is silent and pseudo contracture is shortening due to involvement of non contractile elements of the muscle due to selectivity differential bone growth and collagen involvement is selectivity means supposing the posterior compartment muscles are normal and the anterior compartment muscle is weak then the it, uh, in the strong muscle will pull it in its direction and produce a tendon contracture and differential growth means if the bro, go, bone is growing muscle is not growing saw that the skeletal muscles are all attached to skeleton so when the skeleton grows and the skeletal muscle doesn't grow the muscle gets pulled from its attachment and becomes fibrous that is one cause for contracture another contracture as part of the disease like collagenopathies where the collagen itself is involved so contracture is a manifestation of disease not due to selectivity or differential bone growth then uh, contractures are commonly seen in rigid spine syndrome and we find elbow contractures in congenital muscular dystrophy collagenopathy iliopsoas hamstrings and lower paraspinal muscle contractures are seen in emery dreyfus muscular dystrophy finger contractures are seen in bethlehem muscle uh, myopathy yearly tiptoe walking seen in calpine yearly ta contracture and tiptoe walking in calpinopathies and tendo achilles contracture in duchenne muscular dystrophy Becker's muscular dystrophy (LGMD) and all joints become contracted in arthrogryposis. And next, so that is cramps contracture. Then we are coming to selectivity. So adductors are more involved. Sarcano, sarcoglia. You have checked the power. We saw how to grade the power. You grade the power in various muscles. You find that adductors are worst involved. So when the person sits, the legs will fly upward. then you know it is a sarcoglycanopathy brachioradialis is very weak and absent and most dystrophies except fshd and winging of the scapula fshd scapuloperoneal dystrophies and sarcoglycanopathies <coughs> rectus abdominis early involvement resulting in a protuberant abdomen calpinopathies forearm flexors are early involved inclusion body myositis then rippling muscles caviolinopathy then tapis smooth and whistling posture facio scapulo humeral cupid's bow sign indicates facial muscle involvement not necessarily fshd some kind of craniofacial muscle involvement is seen in central core disease and other mitochondrial disorders and the distal muscle disease involvement distal myopathy myoshi is posterior leg muscles noneka is anterior leg muscle other is called distal myopathy with rimmed vacuole where the quadriceps is sparing spade early foot drop so distal lower limb becomes affected it's otherwise called gne myopathy then uh, facial involvement fshd presence of cataract testicular atrophy and baldness myotonic dystrophy significant neck muscle involvement motor neuron disease polymyositis myotonia and myasthenia abdominal muscles and tiptoe walking calpinopathy bowel bladder very rare but it is seen in hollow visceral myopathy we generally imagine that muscle disorders do not involve bowel and bladder there are exception that is called hollow visceral myopathy and mitochondrial diseases where muscles nerve brain everything can be involved that is mng ie mitochondrial neuro gastrointestinal encephalomyopathy so muscle disease with encephalopathy and also bowel involvement bladder involvement peripheral nerve involvement <coughs> less common conditions so that is mngie so depending on the selectivity pattern we get a gross idea then diaphragm and intercostal muscles uh, getting involved you see in acid maltase deficiency familial superoxide dismutase uh, deficiency myasthenia critical illness myopathy cornitin deficiency myopathy and spinal muscular atrophy type 1 then reflexes are retained in hyperparathyroidism 
Then para thyrotoxic myopathy, that is otherwise called base dose paraplegia. Myopathy associated with calcium abnormality, rickets. Then myasthenia gravis, myositis, endocrine and metabolic diseases. Where that is why this we should look for a reversible cause. I, I said that. Then how are you going to? Uh, so this is a table. So dystrophic muscle disease, weakness more than wasting because as I said, in dystrophic muscle disease, there can be some hypertrophy. So the waste weakness will be more, but that hypertrophy is pseudo. It is not the true hypertrophy. We saw what is true hypertrophy and pseudotrophy. So weakness is more than wasting. Because the bulk is there, the weakness is more. And pain is absent. Pseudo hypertrophy, segmental atrophy, selectivity, and EDB hypertrophy is seen. Then brachioradialis and quadriceps are generally involved. Angle jerk is retained till late and tendoachillis contracture is common and generally fasciculations are absent. Cardiac involvement is common. EMG enzymes and pathology show myopathic pattern. Pain is absent and they are symmetrical. That is the pattern of dystrophic muscle disease. Anterior horncell disease, weakness and wasting are proportionate. Pain is absent. Rarely pseudohypertrophy. Whereas in dystrophic muscle disease, it's very common. It's very rarely it is reported. And triceps is generally spared in antihonsal disease. And hamstrings are involved earlier than quadriceps. And angle jerk is also absent. Instead of TA contracture, these people have flat foot. And fasciculations are present. And cardiac involvement is not common. Tremor in the hands is common. And EMG will show neurogenic pattern. Pain is absent and asymmetry is common. Then secondary or acute muscle diseases. This is the most important group. We should be able to help them. <coughs> so weakness is more. Pain is present. Weakness is more than wasting. For example, you think of uh, um, Hoffman's disease. They, they feel very weak, but wasting doesn't come early. Then uh, pain is present. And uh, pseudo hypertrophy is generally absent, but it can be seen in hypothyroid myopathy, creatine associated myopathies. And there is no selectivity. So there is no sparing of, um, there is no involvement of quadriceps, brachioradialis, like that pattern is not there. And all jerks are usually present. And there is no uh, uh, flat foot. And uh, there is uh, no uh, fasciculations. And other system involvement is very common. EMG will be not very useful, myopathic pattern. Pain is present and symmetry. So this is how after seeing the patterns and knowing the definitions of what is what and put them into various baskets, the patterns I said, then you try to find out is it dystrophy, is it anterior horncell or is it a secondary muscle disease. So this is a person who had severe muscle disease and she had swollen eyes. It's a very rare disease, we, a rare case. We published this patient and when we uh, saw her upper eyelid, there was a bulge and it was uh, very surprising. This is her muscle showing a uh, cysti circus. So this is a muscle showing the cysti circus. So she had generalized cysti circus. Probably she swallowed so many proglottids. Uh, that was a uh, cysti circus induced uh, muscle disease. Then you have got hypoparathyroidism, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. We call it as knuckle-knuckle, dipple-dipple syndrome. So this is pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. You can see the lateral toes, they are behind. Shortening of the lateral toes resulting in the dipple-dipple sign. Knuckle-knuckle, dipple-dipple sign. And this is again uh, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism where you see the elbow contractures and wasting of the forearm muscles. And this is a, a, another patient who had got a renal tubular acidosis. And this child, this was a child. And we have, uh, all, uh, I think we have presented this case as a case of um, uh, uh, club foot. The whole case, this was his epiphysis. And uh, he was treated repeatedly with surgery for club foot. But actually he had a renal tubular acidosis with uh, elevated PTH and rickety changes. Now the child is very active and running down after correction of acidosis and treatment of the metabolic problem. Instead, he underwent three times surgery. 
and this is a prominent eyes with eye movement abnormality and um, retraction of the uh, upper eyelid and uh, she, uh, this is thyrotoxic myopathy the earliest muscles to be involved are medial rectus and inferior oblique but in this patient uh, this is advanced disease all the muscle movements are impaired all the eye movements are impaired and this is myasthenia what we call the plus minus sign when one eye is closed the other eye will open so that is uh, one of the sign in myasthenia this is called plus minus sign so this is showing uh, decremental response if the decrement is more than 10 percent it is significant in this patient you can see very high degree of decrement this is a patient with myasthenia you can see the orbic, uh, expressionless face and uh, after uh, neostigmentous her expressions have improved like anything mm -hmm. and this is a cretin deeper semilane paraspinal muscles hypertrophy with muscle weakness and all systemic features of cretinism that is a um, brother and sister with a thyricose cretin this is you can see the open mouth cadaveric faces and uh, thin out neck and mild expression in the mother and severe expression in the children and they suffer from myotonia. <clears throat> this is percussion myotonia. Uh, when you percuss the muscle, normal persons, they, uh, there appears a bulge that is called myodema. Whereas when there is myotonia, there appears a dimple and the muscle remains in that posture <laughs> for some time before it comes back. So this is percussion myotonia. And uh, here you are seeing the uh, dimple myotonia. You can see the dimple there. This is again uh, percussion myotonia. And this is myotonia congenita. So he is uh, not having any wasting. Unlike the other family where they have got a cadaveric faces, open mouth, neck muscle wasted, that is myotonic dystrophy. This is myotonia congenita. So Herculean uh, build and there is no wasting and this is myotonia congenita, other is called Thompson's disease. This is another myotonia with a peculiar chin, indrawn chin and they have epiphysial abnormality, curled hair. This is called short jumble syndrome. They have involvement of bones and muscles with myotonia. This is short jumble syndrome. This is finger drop. I said that selection within a motor zone. You know that all the small muscles are supplied by C8, D1 and the long muscles are supplied by C7. So if there is a C7 radicular involvement, we expect all of them to go. And if C8, D1 involvement, all the small muscles to go. But here you see that the middle finger alone is dropped. That means one segment selection within a territory. One segment of a territory getting involved is motor unit pattern, that is anterior horncell disease. When eyes and palate become involved in myasthenia, mitochondrial disease, oculopharyngeal myopathy, parasitic myositis, and inclusion body myositis. So we have uh, noted down the pattern, then get the differential diagnosis and put your case into that basket. So this is a uh, child with mitochondrial disease having bilateral drooping of the eyelid and this is a myasthenia, asymmetrical ptosis. The previous one is a symmetrical ptosis. This is asymmetrical ptosis. Then uh, fundus changes in a patient with muscle disease it will be uh, retinitis pigmentosa seen in mitochondrial disease, optic atrophy is seen in nutritional, toxic and mitochondrial disease and coarse disease is seen in facioscapulohumeral dystrophy and this is the uh, what you are seeing is a uh, um, vasculitic. You see linear hemorrhages that will be seen in uh, inflammatory muscle disease. And this is a collagenopathy, contractures which are part of the disease. I said contractures can be secondary to uh, differential growth of the bones and the muscles or due to selectivity, one group is affected, other group is paired or as part of the disease where the muscle and the collagen is involved. So this is a uh, case of collagenopathy where contracture is part of the disease, not explained by uh, asymmetrical muscle weakness. This is another collagenopathy where you see the 
prominent heel soft uh, soles that's called ulrich ulrich congenital uh, ulrich is a collagenopathy and uh, the prominent heels are more obvious in this and the soft sole that is ulrich con uh, congenital myopathy which is actually a collagenopathy and these collagenopathies have hyperextensible fingers and this is how much the child can tilt the trunk because of the increased stretchability so next we have got uh, uh, these are some of our own patients uh, this patient started with uh, features of myasthenia and he had a thymic tumor and later he developed uh, tongue atrophy so a mixed picture of uh, motor neuron disease and myasthenia happened in the same person during different periods of time in the initial period he had a thymic tumor and myasthenia in the later part of his life he developed mnd like picture so that is one reason where now people are also postulating autoimmune etiology for mnd so that you look for a treatable option so this is one of our patient who had a combination of myasthenia to start with and it ended with mnd like feature so overlaps can happen and we should be aware of that then uh, when are you going to think of mitochondrial disease bad obstetric history multiple abortions in the mother so you, you think of mitochondrial disease short stature drooping of eyelid lipomas midline lipomas very hairy skin hair hunger you are not able to find out any heart disease or any lung disease but after running or walking for some time they become gasp that is due to lactic acid accumulation and dc tiredness so these are pointers bad obstetric history short stature drooping lipomas hairy skin hair hunger and dc tiredness then you think whether your patient has got a mitochondrial disease so this is one of our patient who had a midline lipoma due to MRF, mitochondrial encephalopathy raga dried fiber syndrome a whole family in havoc with varying degrees of involvement in many members it's a terrible tragedy that happened to this family and uh, this is uh, uh, her other members and uh, we lost this child uh, the mother is there but now she is a very sick stage because she could not carry this lipoma it is typically said that if you meddle with them they become very big uh, because she could not carry the weight of this tumor uh, she went and got it operated now you see what happened it is uh, typically said that meddling with this, they become very huge. So it's a terrible thing. Now it's a, a double folded huge tumor uh, in her neck. That is a mitochondrial uh, myopathy. You see, and this is self mutation again, excessive hairiness with muscle disease, mental subnormality. So this is a mitochondrial disease. The excessive hair you can see all over her body. This is a, you can see the dry scaly skin of dermatomyositis. And these are uh, examples of various features of uh, salt and pepper appearance and uh, diffuse pigmentation and thickening of the skin, which is seen in dermatomyositis. In the axilla, you can see that uh, there is a freckling and where you find a calcinosis cutis in that site. And uh, this is uh, uh, taken from Professor uh, Nalini. And this is a typical case of Bethlehem myopathy, where we find an uh, large number of keloids. So large number of keloids, if you see in a patient with muscle disease, it is pointing to the diagnosis of Bethlehem myopathy. They also have finger contractures. And this is one of our another person with finger contractures in Bethlehem myopathy. So finger contractures, there is only one diagnosis. No? This is the uh, typical patient with facioscapulohumeral dystrophy from the back. You can see the asymmetrical the involvement of the deltoid um, right more than left. So this uh, typical winging of the scapula. <clears throat> this is two sisters with the progressive external ophthalmoplegia syndrome. So dominant condition runs in families and generally does not become generalized unless it is oculopharyngeal myopathy. So these people did not have any systemic involvement, only eye muscles were involved. Symmetrical ptosis with people sparing, no fatigability, no diurnal fluctuation. So this is progressive external ophthalmoplegia syndrome. And uh, so now the, we saw some examples and uh, how to uh, clue, how to category, uh, categorize, and then try to investigate 
and uh, get at the diagnosis. So clinical history and examination is very important and computated uh, quantitative muscle testing to look for selectivity and patterns of involvement. Then myo biochemical test uh, based on the clinical suspicion. Then you can do forearm exercise test, treadmill test or biocycle ergometry to look for some metabolic disorders like mitochondrial disease, lipid stroke disease, glycogen stroke disease. Then enzyme assays in specific muscle diseases like pombish disease and all. Now there is some treatment. And then um, must, uh, prolonged intensive exercise, trauma and toxins precipitate the first episode of fatty acid oxidation disorders, mitochondrial disorders. Uh, then uh, metabolic myopathies. And then you, um, glycogen storage disease, we thought pseudoclaudication, that is exertion induced pain, cramps, and weakness. And resting state pain cramps is lipistorosis, like carnitine, polymetal transferase, and fatty acid oxidation disorders. And then in muscular dystrophy, uh, this is very rare. And dermatocytis and polymyositis, pain and uh, uh, contractures are there. So that is a clinical pattern. Then laboratory studies, lab nerve conduction, electromyography, and repetitive nerve stimulation, muscle biopsy for routine histology, histochemistry, immunohistochemistry, specific enzyme assays, electron microscopy, genetic testing, and uh, muscle imaging, depending on to look for the selectivity. If you feel in a research setting, you can do muscle imaging. So that is grossly the bedside approach to muscle. And this I planned some time back. Uh, somehow it got uh, postponed and uh, now I have done it. Uh, so, I, uh, as I always say that uh, we uh, always remember that our country is one which gave a lot to the world. Uh, and uh, remembering that we try to do our duty in spite of uh, uh, whatever may be our uh, misgivings. So, I just thought uh, some I am very old now. I retired three and a half years back. So I thought I will just put uh, the people who were lampposts in my life, my teachers and uh, all this. So thanksgiving. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share a broad 